On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Francisco Javier Barajas. Dr. Barajas is board certified in internal medicine. He received his medical degree from Anahuac University, Mexico City, Mexico, and then completed his residency in Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in Englewood, New Jersey, where he was a chief internal medical residence. Dr. Barajas is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Barajas is fluent in both English and Spanish. He provides valuable expertise in liver and gastrointestinal diseases, preventative medicine, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, musculoskeletal disease, and joint injections. He sees patients at Erie Primary Care. Welcome, Dr. Barajas. Good evening, how, how are we doing? It's a pleasure to be here. We're gonna be talking about a very important topic that as we go through the slides, we're gonna realize that a lot of the times we don't know that we have this problem and that's why I think it's very relevant to talk about it because most of the times we do our yearly physical and this is when we have a great opportunity to detect this. As we will see further down, a pre-diabetes it's very prevalent and it has a very high risk of becoming diabetes if we don't do what we have to do. Thankfully, there are tons of resources and things that we can do to help improve our health and turning pre-diabetes into a reversible condition rather than going down to diabetes. Very basic concepts, I've tried to talk more not as a doctor, but someone that you can really understand what I'm trying to manifest here. So you can get the, the most important points. Don't get fixated with all the wording that, are, that, that I have in the slides, more like try to find out the main message that it's go get checked and try to change your lifestyle. So pre-diabetes, basically what does that mean? Is that you are in the road of possibly getting diabetes, but you don't have diabetes. There's a high risk of becoming diabetic, but this is a reversible condition. That's the biggest, biggest difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes. Pre-diabetes is something that sometimes I, can, I, I like to compare with my patients say, imagine someone has a urinary infection, we treat and it's gone. Diabetes, even though it can be managed with medicine or without medicine, it's a chronic condition that is gonna require regular care regular monitoring to prevent complications or to assess that you don't have complications. So that's the main difference. Pre-diabetes is gonna be reversible and diabetes is already a chronic condition. Pre-diabetes, as we were talking, so it's a high level of sugar that are not high enough to be defined as diabetes, but can have the similar uh, pathology that we see in diabetes. So. Pre-diabetes has three main things that we're gonna analyze. One is how we find about pre-diabetes is high glucose, high sugar levels. That's gonna be followed or it's being preceded most likely by insulin resistance. That means that your body has been working extra time producing insulin, trying to make sugar levels go down. And then this is gonna make your body produce more insulin and this insulin is ineffective until your body gets tired, you don't have enough insulin. The insulin that you have is not of good quality. Your sugar levels are gonna go high and you're gonna develop diabetes. These are, this is a very important slide. Don't, you don't need to know the numbers. It's just for you to know that one in three adults in the US have prediabetes. But the biggest concern that we have as physicians more for what I do that is primary care is of, those, of that 30%, if we get that number, eight in 10 of those people don't know that they have prediabetes. And the question or why do they don't know that is because prediabetes usually has no symptoms. 
once you have prediabetes, every year there's a five to 10% increase of the risk of progressing to diabetes. So most of the times we say in 10 years, there's a 50% risk of going into diabetes if you don't change your approach to this condition. Now, diabetes on the other side, remember prediabetes, 30% uh, of uh, the US adults will have it. When we talk about diabetes is one in 10 people in the US will have diabetes. And of those uh, 37 million, there's a one in five that they don't know they have diabetes. Again, same problem. Usually diabetes, unless it's very advanced, there's no symptoms. So why do we screen? I already gave you the answer is because usually we do not have symptoms. Usually when there are symptoms, it's something that I will just tell you usually is like severe fatigue, being very thirsty, a weight loss that we don't have any explanation. We should think I need to go to the doctor and then let the doctor decide what's the best test for you. But definitely think about asking or inquiring, do I have diabetes? So your doctor can help you navigate through these symptoms. Recommendations, basically the bottom line is who do we need to screen for pre-diabetes or for diabetes? Everyone who's overweight or obese. There are guidelines from the USPSTF, let's call it the government guidelines or the American Diabetes Association. Both have something in common and it's based on your BMI. So being overweight will prompt us to screen for diabetes. I am internal medicine, so I usually see 18 years and older. So basically for me, every adult, if the BMI is higher than 25, I will screen for diabetes. Who else has risk of diabetes? So we already know the first two is the main, the main risk factor, overweight or obesity. But if I'm screening someone, or if I already have a normal value, who do I get more concerned? Family history. This is something that you cannot control, but it's something that if there's a lot of family history, it should make you more conscious about who, how you approach lifestyle and diet. Some races and ethnicities have higher prevalence of diabetes, Hispanic, African-American, some native Indians will have higher incidence of diabetes. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, will go very linked sometimes to being overweight or obesity, so that increases your risk of diabetes. Then other chronic conditions have also very high risk of going into diabetes or having prediabetes. What is that? Cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, having high cholesterol. Sometimes we encompass these diseases in what we call the metabolic syndrome. And also uh, female patients that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's very well related to prediabetes. And having diabetes during pregnancy will also increase your risk of developing diabetes after you give birth. So now that we know who do we need to screen, how do we do it? Usually there are three types of ways to approach this. The easiest way or the way that we use the most is checking a hemoglobin A1C. This is a test that checks how your how sugar will bind to, to your red blood cells. Red blood cells usually have a life of three months in your system. So it's a very good test. I usually tell my, uh, some patients when I check A1C and the number is high, they will tell me, well, doc, I was eating sugar just three days or the weekend before, and that's why it's high. And that's when I explain this is a test that usually gives me your sugar for the last three months. So usually I tell them it's like little kids, they will always tell you the truth. So there's no way of, wiggling around. Sometimes if the test is abnormal and we need reassurance and we want to recheck, it's okay to recheck. But it's a very accurate test that you don't need to be fasting to have it done. Then checking obviously your sugar when you're fasting. Usually when you get a number between 100 and 125 is what we call prediabetes. 126 and higher is what we're going to call diabetes. And a test that I usually don't use frequently because it's very complicated for the patient, but it's called the glucose tolerance test where the, where the patient goes to the lab, gets a load of sugar, and then they are checking the sugar after X amount of time. And usually if the sugar after having a, a load of sugar two hours later, if the sugar is greater than 140, we can to 199 is pre-diabetes. If it's more than 200 after two hours is what we call diabetes. 
So here is when we're gonna start talking about what's important, right? Why do we wanna prevent diabetes? Because it's a very, very expensive disease that is related to a lot of complications. So if we can prevent diabetes, at least by detecting in the state of pre-diabetes where we can reverse things, we're gonna possibly completely eliminate the risk of diabetes or at least delay the risk of diabetes. While we work on doing that, we're gonna make sure your pancreas is more efficient, produces better insulin, that insulin is better used by your body and your pancreas does not get tired and then you don't produce any insulin. Preventing diabetes complication. Diabetes is not a disease that is just about high sugar. Actually, the biggest concern is all that is related to diabetes. So cholesterol problems, cardiovascular disease. When I say cardiovascular disease, it's heart attack, strokes, trouble with the big arteries that go to your legs, that's called peripheral vascular disease, trouble with the small blood vessels, trouble with your eyes, uh, trouble with your nerves, trouble with the retina. So there are tons of complications that make the care of diabetes very expensive. If we are to check, 25% uh, of the healthcare cost goes to diabetes. So that's why it's important for us. It's more than $300 billion per year. And that's why we wanna make sure that if we detect pre-diabetes, we hopefully cannot go into diabetes. What can I offer you as my patient to help you go into diabetes once you have pre-diabetes is lifestyle changes. And lifestyle changes is here Sometimes as a doctor, what we deal is a lot of like, you, doctors, you just wanna push a pill. And actually here's one of those that, yes, we have pills, but it's not the main tool we have. Here, the main tool is gonna be yourself. And what do we wanna approach with this is achieving weight loss of five of 10% of your current weight and exercise. We'll talk later of what amount and what type of exercise you can do. At the beginning, if you read this, so two and a half hours per week, and it's like, I'm completely sedentary, there's no way I can do that. The answer is you don't need to start doing that at the beginning, but every day you gotta start working on yourself because at the end of the day, this is about yourself. And this is one of those conditions that is wonderful because depends on what you do, what's gonna be the outcome at the end of the day. There's been trials that we've done. There's one that is very famous that guided us on why do we check for pre-diabetes and the approach that we have for these lifestyle changes that is the weight loss and exercise called the Diabetes Prevention Program involved more than 3,000 patients. And then I'm gonna show you a little bit of the numbers. And here, what I want you to focus is on the graph and the 20, let's call it the blue color that is the 29% is people that have pre-diabetes and didn't change their life. And in the green line, it's people that were diagnosed with pre-diabetes and said, let's work on myself. If you notice the incidence of diabetes in patients that didn't do anything at three years was 30%. That's what I said, like every year there's a five, 10% risk of getting into diabetes. But if you notice the difference in people who change their lifestyle, the risk was cut by more than 50%. So that's the most important thing to see about all these graphs or so that sometimes as doctors we like to show. But basically, if you invest time in yourself, the risk of diabetes is gonna be cut close to 60%. Here's the summary. If you do lifestyle changes, remember five to 10% weight loss. What amount of time, that time it will take you as far as you are committed to doing this. There's no magic number, it's not that. If you don't do this in three months, you're not gonna obtain these benefits, no, actually, if you are working on yourself, and even if I'll see you in three months and you are not able to lose weight, but you are showing that, doc, I'm changing my diet, I've been not doing this, I'm doing, I'm working more on this, that's the right way to go. And it's, my goal is more to encourage you to keep doing that, those things rather than pointing and signaling like, well, you should be doing X, Y, or C. So again, remember lifestyle compared to placebo over, over, it's way, way better and decreases the risk of diabetes 60%. And here, this is important for you to look at. When we have tried medicines, medicines are 30% effective. So if you notice, there's a big difference of just not taking a medicine if you're committed to change your lifestyle. 
So I like to approach now how do I talk to a patient with prediabetes? Because sometimes it's very easy to start just talking about it is not that, but a lot of the times and more with me that, that I start seeing grown-ups, like a lot of the times they come to me and say, hey doc, I'm here because my wife is scheduled the appointment. So there's a little bit already of reluctancy of looking for what's going on. So this is just like a, a case, imagine we have John coming to see me to the office, he's 44 years old. He's here because his wife is scheduled the appointment and told him, well, we have a daughter, she's seven, we gotta take care of yourself. So he comes to the doctor, I ask all the questions, we check his vitals, important here for what we're talking is his BMI is 31, so he definitely qualifies to be screening for prediabetes. And I do labs, we check everything, and from the lab, let's just talk about his A1C comes at 6.1. Sometimes with primary care, we do the physical, we get the labs, and sometimes what I really try to practice is when I have someone that has prediabetes, remember A1C, 5.7 to 6.4, I really try to bring them back to the office. I know we have now this tool called the portal that it's very convenient for some quick questions, but talking about prediabetes should be a visit that we should really sit down and talk for a good amount of time and really try to just focus in that diagnosis and not because you're at the doctor talk about, I have knee pain, I have this lump, because sometimes that can make some noise. And even though it's important, uh, the pre-diabetes talk should be like the highlight of that visit. So, so we call Jay and say, Jay, do you wanna come back and see the dog because your sugar is high? Don't worry, but you need to talk to the doctor and find out what's the plan, all right? So what else do I wanna know about about him, right? What's his physical activity? Why? Because I want to know how familiar is he with exercising, if he feels comfortable going to exercise, if he's comfortable at the gym, does he exercise at home, or does he have a job that he's very active? So we need to find out what's the patient real situation instead of saying, yes, go start exercising two and a half hours per week, I'll see you in three months. Okay, so John says, hey doc, I'm very active at work, but really I'm not a gym person. So he says, I work at the warehouse, I move some heavy objects, but really that's what I do. Um, and then something that is very important for me to talk with is how interested are you about me talking about how can we change this? Obviously, because we're talking today about prediabetes, John is super interested about talking about about this. Sometimes patients are not ready to talk about it and it's okay. It's something that I will just say, it's important for you to consider that when you feel ready, feel free to come back. Otherwise, it's gonna be important for, for us to check your A1C X amount of time, all right? So John here has some physical activity. He's not very active. He's not a gym person and he's really interested in learning more about this. So. When I start talking about what's my intervention plan to patients, there are already the two things that we already mentioned, right? Diet, exercise, and in, I have these that I just wrote down as a smoking cessation, but also I wanna highlight for me, it's very important to talk about stress in life and sleep. Smoking cessation, in case patient is a smoker, why is that important? Why is it related to the sugar? So smoking will cause combustion, will cause inflammation, and inflammation incre increases your cortisol levels. Cortisol is a hormone that we produce that increases our sugar level. So if we already have risk factors being overweight, maybe family history, we already have a high A1C, the cigarette is just gonna be an extra push for that sugar to go higher and push us into diabetes. I ask patients usually, how's your sleep? Is how many hours of sleep you get? Why is that important for me? There's research that has been done and when patients sleep, we always have these magic numbers, seven hours or so. It's important and I always try to find out at what time do they wake up and if they wake up because that's their schedule or if they wake up because they have trouble sleeping. We know that between 3 and 4.30, 5 a.m., our body produces cortisol. So if we are sleeping at that time, the amount of cortisol we produce is not gonna be super high that is gonna increase our sugar. So 
this is like a very holistic approach of, to the problem is we have a high number, but let's work on every single pillar that we can to help you. So remember, smoking cessation, stress, sleep is very important. Now let's talk about first exercise. As we mentioned, the goal is to hopefully exercise five times a week for 30 minutes. And the way it's described, it's a moderate intensity activity. So what does that mean? Basically, the easiest way to find out, besides just reading this, is walking at this speed or bicycle or doing aqua aerobics is, I have a dog and that's gonna be my time for exercise. So sometimes patients say 30 minutes dog is too much. And sometimes the way I tell them is, let's think about a snack exercise. So if you work regular office hours at eight to five and you have lunch 12 to one, try to get those last 15 minutes of your lunch break for a walk. When do you like, and go as comfortable as you can. We are not asking you to start running a marathon in two weeks. This is just about creating the habit and endurance. People that are more committed, what I tell them is get into a treadmill. Ideally, we want to reach 3.5 mile, miles per hour. But if you cannot do that, it's fine. Start walking. And if you notice that maybe because you're out of shape or you have knee problems or other chronic conditions going on. The rule of thumb is like, if you are exercising and you can still talk with being comfortable or sort of sing a song while you're exercising, that means you're doing a good intensity exercise. Very high intense exercise when you can barely say two, three words at a time and then you need to catch your breath, okay? So we have these exercises. If you want to add weights, it's fine. But here it's just to start being active. And ideally, the goal is when patients tell me, well, I have a very active job or I'm very active at, at the house, right? I clean the house, I go upstairs, downstairs. Sometimes the best way to approach this is maybe count your steps. If you can get the, or your smartwatch or any of these devices, ideally we wanna add the exercise to your regular 10,000 steps. That that's the magic number that has shown to improve outcomes so we want yes you are active i understand that let's focus first if we're achieving those ten thousand steps and then if we can start adding exercise if it's 10 minutes 10 minutes are very welcome ideally trying to build up your your physical activity sometimes i need to do a prescription exercise and that's fine sometimes some patients need more of the guidance. And if I need to print, I have even this in my computer and I print this and basically I just feel what is in the previous slide and it's 30 minutes, five times a week, 10 minutes, five times a week. And they have now the prescription. And sometimes there are some dogs that do obesity medicine that will approach it that way, even for diet. Like this is your prescription. So this is not something that is just in the air. Now it's written in paper. And if I give you the, cholesterol medicine, now I'm giving you also your prescription for exercise. So we talk exercise, we talk about all the stress factors, and now let's talk about diet. The dietary approach can be patients that are super ready to talk about nutrition. There's the way to start talking about your macros, right? Talk about carbs, proteins, fats, but there's also an easier way to talk about it, and it's what do you eat? So this time I'm gonna talk more like in general without being super fancy. Sometimes if you have some questions and I have the answer, remember I'm a doctor, I'm not a dietitian or nutritionist. I'll try to answer those questions based on what type of carbohydrate or fat I'm, um, it's better. But let's, the usual lingo that I use with my patients when they are like sort of, I wanna hear about it, but I'm not an expert and I'm not a gym rat that I know all about macros and my protein and goals. So. What I try to do is what's called a 24 hour recall. And basically, and that's why I was telling, it's very important to try to focus this visit just about this. And it's, what did you eat the last 24 hours? And it's not, maybe not just about you, but in the family, what did you eat and what did you drink, okay? And something that is very important is one of the tips that one of my mentors told me is, and always ask about ginger ale, because a lot of people think ginger ale is water, and no, it's not water. So we talk, what did you eat the last 24 hours, okay? 
And what's going to be very important for me to tell the patient is not what they are doing wrong. It's more trying to find out what do they need to add of the good list so they can have a healthier diet. So uh, there's a very good uh, list or some foods that we call the superfoods. And basically, it's everything that is coming from nature is almost going to be there. So fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, grains are part of what we call the superfoods. So imagine John says, Doc, I have a very well-balanced diet. I eat strawberries every day. I eat bread made at home. I eat meat two, three times per day, chicken, and eggs. So it sounds pretty healthy, but here, instead of saying, why are you eating bread? The question will be, what else can we add to your diet to give more support to those strawberries that is sort of the only fruit that you are eating, right? So sometimes I pull, I have these big handouts of what, what I call the superfoods and say, look, not everything is a strawberries and broccoli. So we have all these vegetables, cauliflower, broccoli, asparagus, and then we have all these seeds. Legumes is one of those things that we don't use, or sometimes we don't even know what is that, right? So lentils, beans, are you eating them? Oats. So the more natural we cook and we prepare our food, the best that it's gonna be for us. So what I'm trying to do is not shaming the patient of what they are doing, is more trying to emphasize what else can we add and maybe crowd out a little bit of what's not supposed to be very healthy, but it's not don't do this. It's actually try to incorporate more of this. And most of the times the answer is just portion control because it's very hard to say, hey doc, I have just one grandkid and he loves ice cream. So it's like, okay, don't do it every day, but let's do this goal once a week. But when you go there, get the kids cup for yourself. So it's not because it's, something that needs to be approached in a sustainable way. So that's why like saying, don't ever do this is not gonna work and we know nobody's gonna do that, okay? What it's important also when I talk to patients is learning what's their lifestyle, right? Uh, is there any particular preference they have or they are from any specific region that some type of food is very important? That's also important to consider because it's not just avoid that, all right? So usually when someone is not very educated in this, I don't go by carbohydrates, fats, and protein. If they ask me, I, I, I'm open to talk about it, but why I don't do that if the patient is not ready or has really not dig into that? Because it can be confusing. Because if I say carbs, we can think about sugar, right? But carbs is not about just sugar, it's about the quality of the carbohydrate. And usually the example I say, it's way different a carbohydrate from an apple than the carbohydrate from a soda. Because the apple, yes, is gonna have sugar, but it also has fiber and also has vitamins and minerals. And the soda is just gonna be added sugar. So that's something that it's important why sometimes I don't talk about that with patients. Obviously, if they want it, I talk about that, okay? Then talk, focusing just in the macros, it's complicated because there's no magic formula, right? Everything has to be tailored to the person, right? If the person is just vegetarian or vegan, the protein sources are gonna change and the amount of protein, and there's no magic formula. Nobody has found the magic formula that this is a ratio that it's gonna work. Sometimes what I tell patients that it's very important if we're committed to do this is to get a calorie tracker. Why? Because sometimes it can be eye-opening because a lot of the times we'll see in the office like doc i barely eat and i cannot lose weight and when they start tracking their calories it's like wow i thought i was eating like a little bird and suddenly i'm eating 2500 calories every single day so that's very important for patients they have there are studies that have shown that people who track the calories at least stay in the same weight because they are more self-conscious of what they are ingesting Okay, so usually when we talk about superfoods that I was uh, mentioning previously, these are foods that all research has shown they decrease not just the risk of diabetes, but risk of cardiovascular disease and even the risk of cancer. So we talk about basically trying to incorporate more vegetables. Here I'm not concerned about 
starchy or non-starchy, because this is just like the beginning. Then later on, we can get in more detail, like, okay, try to avoid the starchy vegetables because they can have a little bit of more sugar, can make you feel bloated, can make you feel sick, but just try to incorporate vegetables. Whole fruits, but try not to do juices. Like, one of the easiest ways, ways to cut down on sugar is soda and juices and sometimes alcohol. So, so that's like what I tell my patients, let's cut down juices if you like soda, might be controversial, like if you want to use the diet or zero version regarding risk of cancer. But talking about weight loss, calories, diabetes, they are effective, okay? What I mentioned, in, uh, legumes, right? We don't do that frequently, or maybe we do it and we don't even know that was the name, right? So trying to incorporate beans, lentils, peas, and they have, those are a great source of protein. Uh, trying to incorporate whole grains, right? One example that I tell my patients, obviously, it's very different whole wheat bread than multi-grain because whole wheat is the one that we want to get. Multi-grain, they just mean it has tons of grains and can have what we call the refined grains. Those are the grains that basically remove the good things and they are the ones that unfortunately taste better. So be careful and that's why we want to, eating rice, yes, it's fine, but we want to go more to brown rice that has the vitamins and the fiber, okay? Trying to increase nuts and seeds, almonds, pecans, cashews, it's completely good, chia seeds. Fish, the goal hopefully is two times per week. Be careful with the mercury levels, but if we can achieve fish twice a week, that would be great. Uh, and that's trying to get omega-3, more an anti-inflammatory substance that is not only in fish, we can get it also from walnuts, uh, chia seeds, and flaxseed. So, then there are a group of food that I tell my patients, okay, now we talk about the heroes, now let's talk about the villains, right? And this is basically everything that we like or that it's processed, right? So if it's coming from a bag that is not frozen vegetables, most likely it's gonna be not the best thing in the world. So we talk about meats. We have processed and non-processed meat, right? Processed meat definitely is being linked to chronic disease, so we're talking about like, imagine deli meats, that's basically what we're trying to avoid salami, sausages, bacon, pepperoni, those ones have increased salt, increased chemicals. Those ones we try to eat less, not to say in avoid, but try to eat less, or if we are eating them, maybe start increasing other sources of food so we can hopefully cut down on them. Then unprocessed red meat, beef, pork, lamb, for some people is very important and does not mean don't eat it again, it's just be aware that if you can decrease the amount that you ingest per week, it's gonna be better. But does that mean do not ever eat them, okay? Added sugars, we were talking about the soda, uh, pastries, everything that comes packed in the snack aisle, most likely it's gonna be there. Be careful also, a lot of patients will consider like keto foods that sometimes the lack of sugar is compensated with tons of fat. So just be careful with those things, so even though, the branding of healthy is very iffy, so we gotta be super careful of what we're doing, okay? And what I mentioned about refined grains, basically white rice, uh, white bread, uh, pizza dough, basically what they did is they removed the healthy part because it's more palatable, so we like it, all right? And then there's a group of foods that might be beneficial, they are, have been shown to be super risky, and basically it's our poultry, and eggs, and sometimes dairy products as well that have good fats, all depends here in the quantity. All right, so we mentioned that the weight loss goal is gonna be between five and 10%, the magic number in research is the 7%. As we mentioned, the diet approach is not gonna, there's no one size fits all plan. Everything is gonna be tailored to what's your lifestyle, what are your preferences, to help achieve you those goals. And sometimes, like as we said, the prescription for exercise, there's a prescription for medical nutrition, okay? And this is basically evidence that the more you incorporate the superfoods, the best results you're gonna get. One of those is decreasing your A1C. So with that being said, the diet, the goal is to improve your sugar, your weight, and with those two, we also uh, will improve your cardiovascular outcomes. Sometimes patients like to talk about what are the eating patterns, right? So 
when do I eat, what do I eat, or how much. And that's when we have tons of diets or eating patterns, that are, that's the way I like to call them. And the one that has the strongest evidence is the Mediterranean diet. And basically, Mediterranean diet is summarizing the superfoods, uh, fish twice a week, chicken, and then maybe red meat once a week or every other week. So the Mediterranean diet is basically what we, based on what we already know that has research that shows improving cardiovascular outcomes, decreasing the risk of cancer, de decreasing the risk of diabetes. And then there are other diets, definitely the low carb diet and sometimes goes to the keto diet. All depends how you approach these because in low carb diet, yes, you can cut down on sugars, but you can also compensate that with bacon or lard that is way different if you compensate that with olive oil. Low carbs diet, that what they call keto diet, can be very can be very rewarding at the beginning because you're going to lose tons of weight at the beginning. A lot of this weight might be a lot of just fluids that you're going to be losing. But the biggest problem that I see in the daily practice is these are this is a diet that is very hard to sustain. Very hard to be completely off carbohydrates. It's very complicated. So patients usually will lose tons of weight and then we'll regain that way. And then low fat diet is also something else that we can consider. All these diets at the end of the day, if they help you lose weight, you're gonna achieve the goal of preventing diabetes. So if you are convinced that that's gonna work, just be careful so there are some certain conditions that is not suitable for everyone. If you feel comfortable and you feel that's something that matches your lifestyle, go ahead and do them. There's no way that I'll say don't do that because if you are able to achieve the weight loss, you're gonna achieve the prevention of diabetes. So this is a little bit of the scheme about what's the Mediterranean diet. And good news, you can also incorporate wine. So that's always a plus for the Mediterranean diet. And a lot of the patients also inquire about intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting, it's a great tool. It's being compared significantly to a low calorie diet and they, they bring you the same outcome. But sometimes intermittent fasting is very easy to use for some people. Why? Because it's basically not eating for X amount of time. The classic one is the 16-8, right? So you eat from lunch 12 to 8, and then there's a window where you don't eat. And obviously, part of that window is when you go to sleep. So they have seen, because this is like a narrow window where you can ingest food, if you are very self-conscious of what you eat in those eight hours, definitely you're gonna lose weight. If you are like, okay, I'll eat a little bit with no restrictions, at least your weight will be maintained. So it's a great tool, maybe not for everyone, but it's something that works wonderful, but really beyond the, the theory of going into ketosis and burning more calories is more about the intake of calories. So which pa pattern should I pick? The one that is sustainable for you. And usually what I tell patients, base your decision on the superfoods. And at the end of the day, the weight loss is basically calorie intake and calories that you're gonna be burning. And this is what's gonna get you what's called the calorie deficit. Uh, some people really like to calculate that. There are tons of calculators online. If you're gonna do that, just as a reminder, don't use your ideal weight when you do that because the amount of calories is gonna be crazy low. Try to imagine maybe five pounds in a month and that's a great goal. It's something that is achievable. We, we know that for every 500 calories less that you're gonna have in a week or that by not eating them or not eating them and exercising them, there's one pound weight loss, okay? So again, we have on the superfoods these, the green ones are the foods that we know that are wonderful. In the yellow area that the outcomes regarding cardiovascular disease, it's sort of in the limbo, can be good, can be bad. And then definitely we have in the red, like soda, processed meat, some unprocessed meat as well, that are increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, all right? Now, doctor, is there a role for medications? Definitely, yes, there's a role of medication, but 99% of the doctors will tell you, go first with the pillar of the treatment that is lifestyle changes. Why? Because we already saw that 
definitely outperforms the use of medicine. But sometimes we get concerned and we use the medicines. The medicine that, that, is being, uh, that has the most research for this is metformin. Who do we use it more? Obviously, patients that have significant obesity, uh, patients that have history of diabetes during pregnancy, Sometimes in younger people, if we sometimes when I have a patient that comes to, with pre-diabetes, I say, okay, we have basically three options. One, you don't care. One is you try to do all what you can, or and the sugar gets better, or you are doing and you come here, you're losing weight, and then the A1C is going up, and maybe it was already too late to reverse this. So sometimes that's when we say we might consider putting you on a medicine that can decrease the risk of diabetes. Metformin is sometimes we use it in diabetes. And even sometimes patients with diabetes, we don't even give medicine because we want to treat the main source of the problem, that's the diet, all right? Usually I have a printout that I give to my patients that has resources. So all what we talk about diet, exercise, is called diabetes prevention program. So there are some resources in Boulder County that are very useful and I give them to my patients. There are resources that, uh, are even free for seniors in Boulder County area. Some local YMCA's will have these programs. And obviously later on, if you wanna go to this uh, lecture to view it again, it's also a good resource. Uh, pharmacies in the area that will have these resources and they go more into depth in the nutrition part. Um, there's also one private place that does a uh, boulder nutrition exercise that has some uh, free sessions. And if you go to the CDC webpage that is here, you click the link and you can just type your zip code and we tell you in your area where some diabetes prevention programs that you can reach out and then obviously just get the information. Not all, not all of them are gonna be free, but sometimes it's way, way very useful to invest money in yourself. So remember, Lifestyle outperforms medicine and outperforms not doing anything for yourself, decreases the risk by 58%. Sometimes patients are not ready and I just give these to them if they are really not willing to talk. It's like, okay, so yes, my sugar is high, what do I do? Just give it to me. It's just try to increase your exercise, try to achieve weight loss if you can. Here's when I mention more like portion control might be the, the clue to help you. Avoid soda, avoid juices, choose lo lower calorie snacks, try to at least incorporate one vegetable serving with every meal. And there's a, there's a phrase, never skip dessert. If you're gonna do that, just try to use a smaller portion, okay? Obviously prefer to grill, roast, or broil, or now the air fryer, instead of deep frying food, okay? And for fats, usually what I tell my patients, every fat that at room temperature is solid, usually is not a good idea. So usually my best friends is olive oil and avocado oil. Then the rest is more in the high risk. Uh, I tell patients, be very careful. Avo uh, coconut oil was very trendy a few years ago and even the American Heart Association say, be careful guys, because we're seeing crazy number of very high cholesterol numbers and heart attacks because they are using a lot of coconut oil and coconut oil at room temperature is gonna be solid, okay? And that's basically what I try to recommend to my patients. And basically whatever active movement that you can have is gonna be a win because I don't expect you to run a marathon. And if it's just walking five minutes, that's welcome. And sometimes I tell my patients, I can tell you that because I've done that. Being there, done that. And really lifestyle is what can help you. And it's just a commitment that you gotta do every single day. And the more tools that you get, the more useful this is gonna be for you. And just trust yourself and you are gonna be able to do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Barajas. That was really wonderful. We wanna remind our audience at this time uh, that we are accepting questions so that we can ask those to the doctor. We have a few that have already come in, uh, but audience, uh, we can take more. Uh, so use the chat box below the video, please. So I'm gonna start right in here and these are in no particular order or anything. Um, 
and these come from our audience. So one of the audience members said, remind me, why stop screening at age 70? That's a USPSTF recommendation, and a lot of that goes with Medicare. Sometimes I tell my patients, I will screen for you, maybe Medicare is not gonna cover the test, but if we have to do it, we're gonna do it. So those remember, guidelines is just that, guidelines, and that's the importance of, I read that in Google compared to I went and talked to the doctor. Because yes, and we know actually diabetes diagnosed at an older age usually is way more aggressive than if it's diagnosed at age 50. So yes, definitely, if I have someone that has high risk factors, sometimes Medicare don't let us do that, so we check the sugar fasting, and then if that's high, then we can use a diagnosis to check the A1C, that is the test that we wanna like to use more. But basically, these guidelines is like population type of management, so a lot of that is based on economics, but if you need to be screened, we're gonna do it. Okay, that's good to know. I heard that 10,000 steps was made up by the company that invented the pedometer. Seems like a lot. It's actually a significant amount of steps, but last year there was a good research trial about the magic number. They thought maybe 7,000 was gonna be enough, but there was a significant difference in the 7,000 and 10,000 group. So yes, it's a lot, but now there's enough research. That goes a lot also, patients sometimes ask me like, the amount of water that I need to drink. And there's really no magic number. So and now I, I've been seeing it more frequently or not, maybe social media, people walking with, I don't know, like big jar of water and it's like, I gotta drink one or two gallons. Really, there, there's no magic number. The magic number is drinking of water that your urine is clear. That's it. There's no magic number. Remember, it's not just water. Also, coffee, fruits, vegetables, they're gonna have fluids. So, this one, unfortunately, is not just about the podometer company. There's research that came one or two years ago that showed that 10,000 definitely decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, good to know. <laughs> this person said that they love legumes, but they don't love her or him. Uh, how can I add more of these to my diet and avoid the horrible gas and bloating they cause? gradually, and that's, that's what happens with legumes, and we see that they tend to produce more gas. So here it's gonna be more like the quantity. Obviously, sometimes what I tell my patients is try to introduce one at a time, because sometimes your stomach will tolerate better one type than the other one, but if you try to do a big mix, you're not gonna know which one is the one that is giving you trouble. But yes, definitely that's very frequent. And patients that have irritable bowel syndromes, we ask them to follow what we call the FODMAPS diet. And I tell them, this is horrible because the diet is basically cutting down a lot of foods that are healthy, but we know they produce gas. And it's here, my recommendation will be try one at a time and see how it goes. One tip that I can tell you, you have a lot of bloating, sometimes try Altoids, peppermint, before the meal, and maybe that can make you feel better. When you try it one at a time, how long should you go? For a few days? I would or? usually tell them, see one or two days, and if you feel okay, maybe you tolerate that. And because sometimes there's like what we call the exclusion diet, right? And it's basically just eat grilled chicken and then add broccoli. And some patients love broccoli, but it's one of those that will produce gas. So it's just one at a time. And sometimes it's like, if you love them now, at least you know it's not gonna be dangerous, that you don't have any, any gastric problem. It's just that your body is very sensitive. And uh, it's like, what I'm dying to eat my lentils or my broccoli, just eat it. Just know that maybe you're gonna be a little bit miserable for a few hours. How does intermittent fasting impact blood sugar? eat during a six hour period, then fast 18 hours before eating again, uh, this person is vegetarian. So because it's the calorie intake, what you're gonna be limiting, what I tell patients, if they are on insulin, we gotta be super careful. Because if we use insulin and then we do fasting, then we're gonna have complications. So 
when we talk about prediabetes that we're not using insulin, basically, and that's when that's the nice part of that research they did comparing intermittent fasting with a low calorie diet. The outcome is the same because in low calorie diet is you have access to food all the time, but it's a reduced amount of calories. And intermittent fasting, the window where you can eat, it's smaller and all depends how you approach this window, right? It's sometimes like what I tell patients, the same with paleo diet, right? Like it's like you can eat a hamburger without the bun, but it still like, you know, it's the cheese and all those things. So we gotta be very careful how we approach these things because they can always have a tweak, right? Vegan diet or they can drink regular soda and that's sugar. Right, so all depends on how you approach this and the healthy approach you do to this instead of just saying, yes, this is my lifestyle. But it's basically, the, the goal here is gonna be the caloric intake and obviously the amount of sugars that, that you are eating. And remember, always with sugars, quality and quantity is what matters. Once you start taking metformin, will you be on it forever? Actually, no, this is, this is the wonderful opportunity to where you really have to work with your doctor, right? All depends when did you start it and what changes have you done. Remember, prediabetes is reversible. So sometimes, yes, a lot of patients say, if I lose tons of weight, can I get off the medicine? Definitely yes, or we can try, right? Obviously, someone that comes, Doc, I'm on a cholesterol medicine, but I'm on cholesterol medicine because I had a heart attack, I'm gonna tell him, that's a good idea, but definitely that will be very risky, right? Because there are other things that we're looking with you taking this medicine if you had a heart attack. But if you were taking a cholesterol medicine just because your numbers were high, definitely super valid. And I tell my patients, even if you are not achieving the goals and you said, I just wanna be off the medicine, we can stop and try and see, stop the medicine and we'll bring you here in three, four months and recheck your sugar. If the sugar goes up, then we'll know that the, the A1C is going down because you're taking the medicine. It's something that we do with high blood pressure, right? We give the medicine and the numbers get good, but it's because they are taking the medicine. Obviously, if the numbers get good and they are losing weight, it's yes, depending on what medicine are used, like let's stop one of those and bring you in a couple of weeks and see how's the blood pressure. So with metformin, definitely completely open to, to stop it, give it a three, four month or even six month trial. And usually a lot of patients that ask for metformin usually they are very committed to the lifestyle changes. And a lot of them, we start the medicine and they come three, four months, they lost like 15 pounds. And I tell them, I wish everyone was like you. We cut down the dose or we even stop it. Some patients want to take the medicine and it's safe, okay? But yes, definitely it's one medicine that if the physician and you talk about it and it's okay to stop because there's no risk like having side effects or withdrawals or so you can stop it, give it three, four months to your body and see how the sugar goes. Can you comment on cinnamon supplements? So cinnamon supplements had the good wishes of decreasing the absorption of sugar. My take on a lot of these supplements, what I tell my patients, if you wanna try them, is wonderful. Obviously if I know, if I have the evidence that they are safe, right? Cinnamon is safe. I tell my patients, definitely you can try it, but obviously don't forget about the exercise, don't forget the diet. Don't put all your money in one basket is what I tell them. But if you wanna try it, it's okay. There's some, there was some data that said like maybe cinnamon decreased the absorption of sugar. Cactus leaf is one of the other ones that might have some evidence that decreases that. But it's one of those that definitely, if it's safe, go ahead and try that, it's completely okay. Can taking statins cause prediabetes? That's one of the topics that we see frequently. There's been a, a link about cholesterol medicines and increased sugar levels. Remember, if you are started on a cholesterol medicine, there's already many things going on. The medicine per se has been related to that and also with the body aches, but 90 plus percent of the times, the benefit of the medicine way, way overcomes any possible risk. So definitely, yes, if we have someone that's taking a cholesterol medicine, we check the sugar. But if I have someone that has very high risk for heart attack or strokes with an A1C very close to diabetes, I wouldn't be hesitant to start the cholesterol medicine because 
The sugar per se can increase the risk of a heart attack or strokes. Patient already has a risk with a cholesterol medicine, depending on the indication or so, the, the risk can be decreased in the long term. Remember, cholesterol medicine is not a medicine that if I give it to you, tomorrow you're not gonna have a heart. These are medicines that the more time you are on that medicine, it's the, the, the forward outcome that you're gonna have. It's not something that one year you're good. No, it's something that five years numbers look better, 10 years look better, and down the road, the, the benefit increases. If you had a large baby, 10 pounds, before gestational diabetes testing was available, should you be concerned about developing it now? The risk of going into diabetes from gestational diabetes is around 50% as well. So definitely, I will even discuss with a the doctor, there are some even guidelines that said for every adult, we should screen for diabetes. And it's one of those tests that sometimes when we check tests like is there any benefit or if we're gonna cause stress here? I think the reassurance will be wonderful. So definitely I will say yes, definitely I, I will check the A1C. For the assurance? Yes. Okay. And obviously it all depends the BMI or other things, right? Because we're just thinking about that. So I'm not sure if we had, usually a, that big baby can be related to be like gestational diabetes, not sure if you've had the diagnosis or no, but if you had that diagnosis, definitely it's like a screening for diabetes. And actually they will do it during pregnancy. And actually the OBs are pretty good saying, go to your PCP and make sure they check your sugar now. Okay. Because not all gestational diabetes needs to be on insulin or so during the pregnancy. Sometimes just with diet or metformin, uh, you can be okay. Okay. Um, what is meant by one SSB drink per day increased risk by 28%? Is sweetened beverages. So basically soda, drinking one soda per day in pre-diabetes uh, has been related to have more going into diabetes by 28%. Oh, okay. Um, please explain about the sleep and cortisol levels in the early morning hours. Yes, usually between 3 and 5 a.m. is when our body produces cortisol. So if we're awake at that time, we're going to have higher cortisol. Cortisol increases the production of sugar. So if we sleep, our amount of cortisol is not going to be crazy high. Same thing like with a, what we call a inflammation. And we're not talking inflammation when you have like a sprain elbow or so. Like the body inflammation, insulin resistance increases cortisol. This is a hormone that increases the production of sugar. So between 3, 5, three and 5 a.m., if we have a good sleep, sleep hygiene, the, no, the amount of cortisol is not gonna be crazy high. It's gonna be a low number compared to very high numbers. Okay. Insulin resistance was mentioned earlier. The Go Low Diet talks about insulin resistance. Do you know about the Go Low Diet pills and if it's helpful? couple of patients actually this week are taking that. And if you look at the, at the components, most, most of them are vitamins, minerals. So usually I tell my patients, definitely you can take it. I did the research, look safe. Not sure what's their data. What my research was, is it safe for the patient to take? Sometimes what I tell my patients when they do supplements, because I'm, I don't know all the supplements, right? Is make sure you look if there are like reports of liver failure or liver toxicity. Because that's the biggest concern, like supplements are not FDA approved, they're sort of regulated, but it's not FDA approved. So I tell them most of the times, if I don't know them, it's like, I even sometimes do the research with them when they are in the office, and that's a good thing now of having access to the computer. If they, I, I look for that one, I didn't see any, any evidence of significant risk, but the same as we said with cinnamon, yes, if you feel that you wanna do it, okay. But remember there are other many things that you need to do because unfortunately with lifestyle, is, there's no magic pill that we're gonna take care of you. Okay, this person is asking about carbs from uh, good bread. Uh, is there like a difference between good bread and not good bread? And then also having more than one alcoholic drink and the difference between drinking wine versus vodka, gin, et cetera. So a uh, bread, we wanna go wheat bread, brands that, <laughs> that's gonna be open to you. Sometimes the, the only thing that I've seen in keto bread, they, they might have more protein, okay? 
but we want to go with bread. Be careful again with multigrain, and obviously we know white bread has the flour that is more attractive to humans and doesn't have a, the, the fiber or the other things that we're looking for. So in general, now that everything is very expensive, whatever fits your budget, but try to go with, okay? Uh, so there are some like 45 calorie versions that it basically is the slices thinner. So just be, be mindful about that. Uh, that was about the bread. And then what was the other part of the question? The alcohol, the difference so between- So alcohol in general, the drink that goes straight is like 100 calories or so. So it all depends on the amount and what you mix the drink, right? So that, that's the magic, right? Because seltzer is also like in the 90, 100 calorie range. So if it fits your budget, like your caloric budget, maybe be okay. Obviously make sure you don't have any other, other contraindications because you have liver issues or so, but that's the main problem with alcohol because you use some other things to mix it with that it's the empty calories like soda or juices. Uh, Gin, a lot of people will do it with tonic water, and tonic water has tons of calories. So that's the that's the trick there. Wine will have also some some sugars. There are now like keto wines that don't have many sugars, and they sometimes promote that they won't give you headache or so. One glass of wine is part of the Mediterranean diet, and actually that and exercise is the only thing that can improve your good cholesterol. So if you are able to do just one glass and you don't have any contraindications, you should be fine. Does olive oil change when you fry a chicken breast in it? Does it become unhealthy at that point? This is a good question. Every oil that gets heated is not gonna be the best in the world, but if we have to choose the least evil one, it's gonna be olive oil and avocado oil. Uh, but obviously don't use just like a small amount that it's enough just for the chicken not to stick to your pan. That's the wonderful thing now about the air fryers that you can use these sprays, make sure just the spray doesn't have this repellent that can be harmful to you. But if you use a small amount, it's okay because you also need to have fats. But every fat that gets warm is gonna be not healthy. Okay. We're gonna squeeze in a few questions here, but um, wanted to remind our audience that we won't be able to get to all the questions tonight. Um, but we will get to just a few more here. Uh, what does the A1C number refer to and what is the healthy range? Healthy range 5.6 or less, 5.7 to 6.4 is this area called prediabetes, 6.5 and up is diabetes. And remember A1C is a test that will check your sugar that gets attached to your red blood cells. So usually it's an average of your sugar for the last three months, four months. Do you think continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, are the wave of the future? Do you think they could play an important role in the management of prediabetes as well as diabetes? CGMs are, a, so in prediabetes, here again, the, sometimes as a doctor, I'm glad that I asked this question. So. A lot of the times healthcare is not what the doctor feels is better for you, it's sometimes what the insurance will do. So a CGM is gonna be very hard to be covered in prediabetes, but that's insurance issues. Pre in prediabetes, CGMs are wonderful as a learning tool because you're gonna learn how your body responds to sugar. So you will see that if you eat, if you drink soda, your sugar is gonna spike and then it's gonna take some time to go down. But you're also gonna learn that if you eat some carbs and you add protein to those carbs, the sugar is gonna go high, but it's not gonna spike as if you eat those carbs. So it's a great tool for insight of knowing how, how your body controls sugar. In diabetes, the same thing is more that type of tool. Obviously, if you're taking medicines that can lower your sugar, it's great. Sometimes, again, insurance is a big limiting factor because sometimes we'll cover only if you're on insulin four times per day. But if a lot of patients would like to use it, it's wonderful. The same thing, some patients ask me, do I need to get a finger stick? You don't have to, because a lot of the times with the finger stick, obviously if we're using insulin, definitely we gotta use it. But sometimes it's like, if you, there are some medicines that we use for diabetes now that don't even cause hypoglycemia. So 
is not necessary in pre-diabetes, but if you wanna learn how are you doing or how your body is doing, more than welcome. I will tell them, if you wanna do that, just do it in the morning, no need to be pricking yourself if you are doing a regular finger stick. But with the CGM, if you are able to get one or, the, or your plan covers that, it's a wonderful tool to learn how your body will react to sugar. 